While you're taking your seats, how many of you were here this morning? Remember the context of the message this morning? Any of you happened to see the guys out on the street today as you drove in, the protesters? That's what I was talking about. That's what happens when you misrepresent the Lord. That's what happens when you misrepresent his word. It's what happens when you misrepresent his character. Because if you notice on those signs, they're very specific and pointed at a couple of sinful behaviors, which clearly scripture condemns. But Jesus himself addressed a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, did he not? What did he say to that woman? You remember? He spoke right to her and said, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Furthermore, with the issue of divorce, Jesus actually said that there were biblical reasons or a biblical reason in the case of a wronged partner. And so when you simply say that those who are divorced will not see the kingdom of heaven, you misrepresent the Lord. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because like all other sins, divorce can be forgiven. Adultery can be forgiven. Thievery can be forgiven. Murder can be forgiven. Case in point, David. I want to take time and pray for them because what they don't understand is the marvelous grace of God that's able to heal the most broken, touch the most perverse, minister to the deepest wounds, and can even get through to people who say they're from a church down the street. Remember what I said this morning? That often it's from the inside, it's from the church, from people who think that they have a corner on the righteousness of God. None of us have a corner on the righteousness of God. All of us are works in progress in that sense, on that journey of sanctification. So would you join me and we'll pray and we'll pray for our time in the word as well. Let's lift these guys up that the grace of God would touch them. Father, uh, we pray for these two men that are standing out there even now with these signs that really are not going to afflict many of us here because we understand your grace. But they definitely might afflict someone who's driving down the street and think that they've committed some unpardonable sin that the grace of God can't reach. And we ask, in Jesus' name, that you'd break their hearts, that you'd crush their spirits, Lord, that they'd not be able to sleep while they have those signs out, Lord, as they condemn without the hope of grace, God. Would you move mightily right now to upset their apple cart of what they think they know about you? Help them to understand your deep and abiding grace, your marvelous mercy, the power of your forgiveness and restoration, Lord. Lord, we hold no ill against them. I hold no ill against them. I pray that you would simply minister to them by your loving power, Lord, that would just draw them to repentance, Lord, of steering people away from your grace. Fill this place and fill us, Lord, with your love and with your grace and your mercy and your tenderness. Even as we look at your prophetic word, Lord, and as there are things that are said that are strong, and we thank you that you have not yet returned to take your church home. You haven't brought these days upon us yet, so there's still time in the age of grace. Lord, minister to us as your people as we study your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel chapter 11, the final six verses here in chapter 11. Now, as I shared with you when we began this journey through the book of Daniel, I, I personally am one of those people that believes that 
Without the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation would be nearly impossible to understand, and vice versa. That the book of Daniel is actually aided by our understanding of a book that would be written much later in history, uh, some 700 years later in history, the book of Revelation. But because we've looked at these passages, we realize that there's been a consistent theme. There have been empires, there have been princes, In other words, there's been literal people that have been involved. And then I want you to look at what we have in this remaining portion, the pronouns that are here, the he's, which relate to the same he's that are in the previous five or six verses, that there is literally one day going to come this willful king that's in view, that we described as the Antichrist, the one that would come, It would be, in essence, Satan's henchmen during the very last days, a time that we know as the the time of Jacob's trouble or, or the tribulation, the very last days. And it's described for us here and given a picture of it in verse 40. And it says, at the time of the end. And there should really in our English language be a comma there. Because that's a thought. At the time of the end, a very specific period, is referencing all the way back to chapter 9 to that final seventh week, uh, that remaining time that Daniel referred to uh, in his 70 weeks prophecy. 69 have occurred. We're still waiting for one. There's been a grand parenthesis in time. And there in that intervening time has been the age of grace, the last several thousand years, as God has been dealing with mankind by his grace through the cross of Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus, which is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? If we didn't need the grace of God, if the law could have saved, the cross would be meaningless. But Daniel was looking forward to the cross. The Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. And then we're given this vision of the very last days. At the end of time, the king of the south will attack him. Now notice the personal pronouns. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. And so it's very clear that the king of the north, which was Syria, the king of the south, which is Egypt, so Egypt and Syria in the very last days will join together, will have a consortium, if you will, of nations. And this fits extremely well with the book of Ezekiel and that final Gog, Magog conflict that will go on, I believe, for a period of time that at least includes the tribulation, possibly starting before and being more of a campaign, something that the Antichrist will come on the scene and solve. He'll be the one that writes the peace treaty that I believe ends that particular conflict, at least for a time. And understand that as Daniel's writing this, his reference point uh, would not be battle as we know it today with helicopters and J-35 strike fighters and cruise missiles, M1A1 Abrams tanks, striker vehicles, combat arsenals that include body armor on everyone and helmets and those types of things. He would have understood and written in his time frame. And so he writes about this battle with the absolute most high-tech armaments that people had during that time. Chariots, horsemen, many ships. And notice he'll enter enter the countries uh, that are going to be attacked and overwhelm them and pass through. And then he, same he, uh, is being attacked by the king of the north, the king of the south. And that king is the willful king, the one that's described there in verse 36 for you. And he shall also enter the glorious land. That is the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the promised land. It's the land of Canaan. It was inhabited by the Canaanites. And people often ask, well, you know, the Canaanites were, was that a specific 
people group. Was it a people group with a language? No, it wasn't. It's a description for a group of peoples that included the Amorites, the Amazites, the Hittites, the Moabites, the Edomites, a whole bunch of ites that inhabited the land that is the promised land as we know it, the land given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There were people in the land. And that's why when Joshua and Caleb came into the land and they stood at Kadesh Barnea and they looked in, they, they saw the, these well-served kings, an empire. They looked at it and said, we're going to be like grasshoppers to these guys. There's, there's the, the rest of the children of Israel perished in unbelief. They didn't enter the land. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go, let's get it. That's because the land was inhabited. There were hundreds of thousands of people that existed in the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promised land. It would eventually be divided up after the conquest of Joshua and Judges during that period of time where the tribes would receive their inheritance. And so Daniel, seeing the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Interesting triplet of peoples, because they are all in modern-day Jordan. They're the descendants of Esau. And so here is this specific group of peoples that all dwelled in a very specific region. And he, the willful king again, shall stretch out his hand, the willful king again, against the countries, against the land of Egypt, and it shall not escape. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt and also the Libyans, the Ethiopians, shall follow at his heels. And so this obviously is all of North Africa, which interestingly enough, these are now Muslim countries or predominantly Muslim countries. But the news from the East, very strange, because we already saw one of those kingdoms that had come and gone was Media Persia, modern day Iran, known up until 1979 as the Persian Empire. And so the Persian Empire uh, is in the east, but it seems to indicate that this is a people that's beyond uh, Media and Persia. And to the north shall trouble him. Again, same king. And therefore he, same king, the willful one, will go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace. Now this is an interesting phrase. Because if you were to look at this in Hebrew, it would be like Air Force One. This is command central. The tents of his palace would be any king during that period of time when they traveled out into the battlefield. There was an array of tents that were specifically for the king. This is where the king resided. In fact, wherever those tents were, that would also be taken as land of that kingdom just exactly as when our president is flying over the United States and he goes out over international waters, that little airspace that he's in is the United States of America. And so this is a similar wording. It seems to indicate that this particular willful king will have his own kingdom and that kingdom will have its own palace and that palace is going to be set up in a very strange place just outside of the glorious holy mountain between the seas and the holy mountain, which is exactly one place that we find in the book of Revelation, the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is also the place of the very final end battle that we call Armageddon. And so here, this willful king sets up his final tent, if you will, there in the valley we call Jehoshaphat. And yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. And so this is where the Antichrist finally meets his doom. 
He's purported at first to be a man of peace. He's managed to establish a peace treaty between Israel and those that have attacked them, which at that time would be this Gog-Magog alliance. It would include Russia and a whole bunch of their Arab, the Arab neighbors that surround Israel today. And so here, uh, this, this man that we call, and notice it's a he, it's a him, it's a his. It's never an it, a they, or a them. This is a person. And so the Antichrist has risen to power, and this is kind of his final foray into the world. It's a, tri- a crisis that I believe occurs directly in the middle of the tribulation, the very last days. And so this prophecy kind of begins as this willful king invades Israel and sets up ultimately, as we saw last time, the abomination of desolation, which again, cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes. We know who Antiochus' God was. That was Zeus. He worshiped Zeus. That's the image that he himself established. Uh, When he desecrated the temple, he put an image of Zeus and then slaughtered a pig uh, inside uh, of the holy place. Uh, And so we know who Antiochus was. So this has to be someone else. And I believe that someone else is described for us in Revelation chapter 12. And if you want to turn there, you can keep your finger in Daniel, turn to the end of the Bible, uh, to the very last 15 pages or so. And to Revelation 12, verse 13, you'll find this. And now when the dragon, same guy, the willful king, saw that he had been cast to the earth, or excuse me, Satan saw that he had been cast to the earth, that he is the same he, persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Israel is viewed by giving birth to the male child, which is none other than the Messiah, Jesus, amen? But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time and a times and a half, so another three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. And of course, the serpent is Satan. And the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. It's interesting phraseology here. It it literally appears that the earth itself, the arets, the earth, the dirt, the rocks, the canyons, somehow helped this woman, which would be Israel. And the earth opened its mouth. In other words, a a gaping mouth is opened in the earth somehow to hide Israel. And swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. In other words, the, the protection that comes to Israel is a place. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war against the rest of her offspring who kept keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so you can see here the separation between the church, those that came to Christ during the tribulation, in other words, churches in heaven. There are those that have given their life to the Lord Jesus. There are still believers, haven't been martyred yet. Uh, But the Antichrist goes out and Satan is enraged during this particular period of time in the book of Revelation. And because the identification of the princes here are continuous, Um, From the previous prophecies in this chapter, the king of the south, the king of the north, and the willful king are all the same person. And any way you look at this, Egypt loses, Syria loses, and the willful king rises. Interesting that these two countries, in September on September 28th of 1961, only two countries, Egypt and Syria, proclaimed that they would have a political union joining together called the United Arab Republic. And that was ended in 1961, later that year, when Syria declared itself independent from Egypt. So in our time domain, in the time in which we live, Egypt and Syria came together. Egypt and Syria battled against Israel Egypt and Syria had an alliance, and Egypt and Syria have since separated. And so you can kind of see this is all in the works even today. Uh, And when you look at what the book of 
Ezekiel says there, and specifically in chapters 38 and 39, this Gog-Magog conflict, these nations that come together, and certainly uh, Egypt and, and Syria are in that mix, along with Persia and Russia and, and several others of the neighbors that surround modern Israel today. You can imagine that what Daniel's seeing as he's seeing this vision, as he's understanding these things, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to him, uh, he gets a vision of something that was future to him, and it's still future to us. Those battles never taken place. It's never happened. There's never been all of the nations of the earth gathered against the nation Israel, and certainly not in the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, known as the glorious land. And so that day still lies ahead. Notice here that there are some protected people. An interesting and amazingly enough, that they're all in modern-day Jordan. But they're going to be delivered from the hands of the willful king. One of the things that you'll see uh, when we travel to Israel, we're going this time, we kind of alternate uh, every other trip, and we go to Petra, which is in Jordan. And I think there are, there are many of us who believe that this is the likely place that's being mentioned here. We can't be too specific on it. But I myself am fairly convinced that it would certainly be a likely refuge. When you look at the wording that's used uh, in the book of Revelation as to how the children of Israel are going to be spared, that the earth itself would spare them. The earth would open its mouth to receive them. They would be gathered together in a wilderness area and somehow be preserved from the attack of the Antichrist. Now, we're prone to think, because we live in a day of modern warfare, that because of that modern warfare, we can do things like fly drones and all those kind of things. Um, but I'll give you an example. If, for those of you that have been around for a while, you may remember when we were trying to hunt down Osama bin Laden in the Tora Bora region of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Does anybody remember how long we took? It took a little over five years of the entire intelligence gathering capability of the United States of America to hunt down a single man, one. We then dropped the world's largest non-nuclear ordnance on 10 different caves in the Tora Bora region, 25,000 pound conventional explosives called, oddly enough, after a place in Utah, Moab, or mother of all bombs. The shock wave that went through those caves caused people inside of them to be turned to jelly. I'm telling you this for a reason. I'll get to it in a second. We, we sent everything we had to try and find one guy living in a mountainous region filled with caves where people could hide and we couldn't find him and we couldn't kill him. He was eventually turned on by some of his own people. And of course, the rest is, is history as we call it. And so before you say, well, you know, why would they go to Petra? Well, Petra is a very interesting place. When you travel there, if you've seen uh, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, you've seen this as the treasury, and you've seen that, that is the Sikh. The Sikh is about a mile and a half long. In spots, it's less than 30 feet wide. In spots, it's over 400 feet tall. But the entire city is built out of nothing but solid rock. It's caves and canyons and buildings built inside of every kind of rock formation and canyon you can possibly imagine. And, and when you travel there, there's something that, that strikes you. This is a huge city. And in fact, there have been some studies, there have been some fairly crazy people that did things like deposit Bibles there because they believed that the rapture was coming in 1988 and it didn't happen. I'm not adding to their foolishness of making a statement about something that the Lord told us not to do. But they've calculated at least 5 million people could live in the area of Petra, just in the surrounding caves and canyons, and except for direct aircraft strike, they would be completely safe. You'd have to hunt them down basically one by one in, in the rock city of Petra. It's a fabulous place. 
buildings carved completely out of the sandstone cliffs, gigantic, unbelievably large buildings, caves, tombs. There are over 2,000 tombs in this area carved in the solid rock. There's an amphitheater that seats almost 10,000 people carved out of solid rock. And so before you say, nah, that's not really likely, you might want to come with us and check it out for yourself. Just a little plug for Israel. Now, it is really amazing. And you can easily see, as you look back, as you're leaving, that area behind there is where the Sikh takes off and there's a water channel. They've done an amazing job of channeling rainwater into catchment basins and cisterns and car- everywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go. Uh, for several hundred square miles. There's actually another settlement in the next canyon over that's almost as magnificent. And so I, I believe that at least it is a possibility that the Lord might send uh, the Jewish people to this desert place uh, to pre- be preserved. And oddly enough, these three people, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, are all exactly where that city is in ancient times. A dragon persecutes and takes care. It's interesting also that when you look at the words of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, as you think on what Jesus was saying there in verses 15 to 22, and he says, therefore, speaking of Daniel in verse 15 of Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the by Daniel the prophet. Now, it's interesting because the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet had to have happened after Daniel the prophet, amen? So it can't be that it was Antiochus Epiphanes, amen? Because he's already been dead for 168 years, actually almost 190 years by that time. And so Jesus is saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, what do you need to be standing in a holy place? You need a temple. When Jesus spoke these words, the abomination of desolation had not yet happened. Antioch's Epiphanes was dead. And in 70 AD, the Roman general Flavius Titus sacks Rome and destroys the temple. There hasn't been a temple for the last 2,000 years. So we have a little bit of a conundrum that places this sometime after today because there's still no temple in Jerusalem. There's a very large mosque, the Al-Aqsa. There's the Haram al-Sharif. There's another mosque that we call the Dome of the Rock. There's another mosque called the Dome of the Chain. There's another mosque that used to be Solomon's stables, but there's no temple. And so Jesus said, when you see that, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for there will be great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. Now, if this time has to be after 70 AD because there hasn't been a temple and there has to be a temple, then this time has to be time that's later than tonight. It's still time, a later time from today. That great tribulation. And it says that that tribulation would be greater than the time, uh, greater than anything that had ever happened in human history is the basic inference here. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So it appears that from Daniel's perspective, from John's perspective, writing from a cave on the island of Patmos, the book that we call Revelation, 
that the most dangerous place to be in the world during the very last days is going to be Jerusalem, Israel, the region of Judea. And that's not my take on it. That's what Jesus said about it. Because the second event that we have here is the Battle of Armageddon. As you think about what that time will bring, notice verse 44 with me, if you would. A dragon, the Antichrist, is going to be thwarted in his attempt to capture this fleeing remnant of Israel. Um, the rest of their offspring, described in chapter 12, the true believers in Jesus are going to be miraculously saved by the Lord. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Again, same him, the willful king. And therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. His whole goal will be to wipe everyone out. Now this is interesting because your Bible actually says that in the very last days, now people don't like the book of Revelation for this very purpose. And I'm not saying that when I read it, I go, wow, that, that's so awesome. Two thirds of the world's population is gonna be wiped out eventually. But that's how serious God takes sin. That's how serious God takes the mistreatment of his people, Israel. That's how serious he is about dividing up the land that he gave to his people, Israel. And so news is going to come from the east and the north, two interesting places. And he shall plant his tents and his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. So there's going to be a place, some place there in the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the confluence of the Hinnom and the Kidron stream. Uh, it's in the modern West Bank of Israel today. It's on the other side of the border security wall. But these reports that come, I believe, are described actually in the book of Revelation in chapter 9. And now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. Where did they come from? Of the east, because they have to cross the river Euphrates. What's the only country that is east of the Euphrates River that could possibly put together an army of 200 million men. It has to be the only army on the face of the earth that today could put together a standing army of 200 million men. It has to be at least associated with modern day China. Notice what it says. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and he, those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red and hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow. Does anybody know what the national colors of China are? Hmm. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. And again, remember, he has no reference point. He's never seen a tank. He's never seen an APC, an armored personnel carrier. Uh, he's never seen a Black Hawk helicopter. He's never seen a strike fighter. He's never seen a cruise missile. He's never seen, has no reference whatsoever to those things, would have no way to describe them. So what does he describe? He describes the most awesome display of armor that he could possibly describe because this is John writing in AD 90. Now notice what he says. Remember what Jesus said about this time? That it would be like none other, that nothing like it had ever happened from the beginning of the world until the time, and the time is given to us as after there's a temple on the Temple Mount and the Antichrist desecrates that temple. It's still not there, so this is still talking future. And thus I saw these horses in the vision. Heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three plagues, one-third of mankind was killed. In other words, it's describing global conflict. It's not describing a regional war. The entire world has come against Israel. The entire world has come against the Antichrist in that sense. They're, they're fighting amongst themselves. They're, they're terrorizing one another. 
And by the smoke and the fire and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, they're all destroyed for their power was in their mouth and in their tails and their tails are like serpents having heads and with them, they do harm. And so this giant army gathered together uh, that I believe is these bowls of wrath, God's wrath, and we're told it's God's wrath. So when people say, well, you know, we've been having wars since the beginning, that's true. But God's wrath has never been poured out on this earth. But your Bible says one day he's going to pour out his wrath on this earth. And he tells us why. You, you see, sometimes people just think that God indefinitely is going to continue with mankind and we'll just struggle along and eventually we'll come to our senses and get it all right. But in Revelation 16, verse 12, it says, And then the sixth angel, angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates and his water was dried up. And so it prepared the way of the kings from the east. Again, where's the army coming from? The east. Where is the only army of that size? Two, imagine 200 million. Anybody know how many inhabitants we have here in the United States today? 340, 350 million, depends on who you talk to. What politician gives you the number? 300 and something million. Imagine that you have a standing army. Anybody know how many people we have currently in our military? It's less than 2 million in our regular military. Imagine an army of 200 million people. Guess what happens in China if you're a male? You're conscripted into the army automatically. So they can actually field, and it would not be easy. But the Bible gives a number here that to this day would be extremely difficult for any country on the face of the earth to field an army of 200 million men except one country, and it happens to be east of Israel. And so these kings gather together in this place in Hebrew called Har Megiddo. We call it Armageddon. The city of Megiddo sits on the edge of the plain of Escadrelin in the valley of Jezreel. We call it the valley of Megiddo, but it's actually a city and it guarded in biblical times the entrances to the coastal plain, the plains of Sharon. It also guarded the plain of Akko and the plain or the valley of Jezreel. And the whole of the area is where this battle will occur. Interesting, guess where, where Israel's navy is stationed? At the head of that valley in Haifa. There is one pass what city do you think guards that pass? That would be Megiddo. That's why it is purported to be one of the world's oldest continuously inhabited settlements up until biblical times. About 3,800 years of civilization, layer upon layer upon layer. And when you travel there, uh, you, you look at these devastation layers to where that particular spot has been guarded for thousands of years because of its military value and because it sits on the edge of one of the only places where there's flowing water uh, in the Jezreel Valley. And so here, this battle will take place. The kings come, same place, by the way, that Joshua uh, fought there in the book of Judges. The kings came and fought the kings of Canaan um, there by Tanakh at the waters of Megiddo, and they carried off no silver and no plunder. And so this place, God predicts through the prophet Joel, uh, the reason why this battle is going to happen. And if you want to turn there, Joel chapter 3 is a reference point. Joel 3, God himself is telling us the reason why ultimately he is going to deal with mankind all of the nations of the earth. Now, notice this well. Verse two, Joel chapter three, I will gather all nations. How many nations? Every last one of them. All nations will be represented. The Antichrist, when he rises, is going to do something amazing. He's going to accomplish what no ruler has ever accomplished. He's going to put all of the entire world under a single government. So how easy will it be to gather together all nations if you have one head and his name's the Antichrist? He brings his armies, in essence, against God's people. God's people are on the other side of the Jordan River, scarce, scant 35 miles away. 
in what we would call the mountains of Edom, which also happened to contain the rock city of Petra. I'll gather together all nations and bring them down. So what's he going to do? He's going to gather them together. Well, if you're a military commander and you have to get troops there, the quickest way to move massive amounts of troops is not by air, it's by ship, isn't it? You can put thousands on a troop transport ship. You can only put a few hundred in any aircraft. And so the port city of Haifa, which happens to also be very close to the port city of Tartus, which is the Russian Navy's headquarters in the Mediterranean. And so all of these things working together to kind of give us a picture that God was giving us a little preview of the military significance of that region. And as I showed you last time, the Ramat David air base is in the middle of the Jezreel Valley. That's Israel's, they have three major military bases, air bases. And that is the largest one. Just adjacent to that is one of the sites that when you travel there, they, they say, well, we could tell you what we're doing over there. We'd have to kill you. Um, it's because it's their nuclear site. If you travel down south to Beersheba and you're driving over the Judean foothills and you look and they kind of wave their hands and the tour guides say, well, you ask them, well, what's that? And they go, well, that's where we make things. Yeah, like atomic weapons. Israel has never admitted to possessing atomic weapons, but they have atomic weapons. And in fact, in 1986, the Israeli air defenses made a strike on the reactor in Saddam Hussein's reactor, reactor in, in Osirak, in, in right outside of Baghdad. And as they destroyed that, the reason they did so is because Iraq was in the process of gaining nuclear, at least fissile material for making atomic weapons. And so they're well situated to take care of themselves. The reason the whole world's gonna come against them is they are extremely powerful. Notice what it says. Gonna bring all the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Strange, where is the tent set up? Same place, Valley of Jehoshaphat. Why? There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance. What was the inheritance that God speaks of in Joel? Anybody know? It's the Jewish people. It's Israel. It's his chosen people. They were to be a perpetual inheritance So he's not talking about the church. The church doesn't even exist yet. This is 700 years prior to the existence of the first Christian. My inheritance. And then to help us understand it, notice what he says. My people, Israel. Just in case you don't know what it is, he tells us. My people, Israel. Why? For they scattered my people among the nations. We call that the diaspora. Amen? Amen that the Jewish people, God's chosen people, were sat upon by the world. They were condemned, destroyed, murdered, slaughtered, little things like the Holocaust happened to them. And so God says, here's the reason that ultimately I'm gonna gather these nations together because of what they did by scattering my people among the nations. And notice this, dividing up my land. Anybody want to take a guess at why I don't think land for peace in Israel, even though Prime Minister Netanyahu is actually for it? You want to know why that's a bad idea? Because God said it's a bad idea. Because the land doesn't belong to Israel. It actually still belongs to God. Notice he says it's his land. He gave it to Israel as a permanent inheritance. And so the nations that come against Israel to divide Israel, to scatter them into the nations of the world, and to divide up God's land to give it to somebody other than Israel, that's the reason that eventually God's going to come against the nations of the earth. For one little tiny country that currently has a tad less than 9 million people in total. Let the nations of the world be roused, it says in verse 12. 
Let them advance to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge. Remember, remember what Daniel's name actually mean, means? It means God is judge. So Daniel writes this book that, that bears his name. And it says that one day God will judge. I will sit, God will sit to judge all the nations on every side and swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe and I will come and trample the grapes for the wine press is full and the vats overflow. It is so great and it is their wine press, multitudes upon multitudes for the valley of decision for the, there it is, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And so the great prophet Joel uh, reminds us of the truth that Daniel sees, this final siege, this end of Daniel's final week, this 70th seven, this time of Jacob's trouble, the time when God finally says, enough. I'm not letting you treat my people this way. He's already pulled the church out. We're a, we're a non sequitur at that point. We, we are not in the equation. The church's home in heaven. And that turns her attention to what will happen as the very end of that, that conflict, that battle that we call Armageddon, the second event. Notice what it says in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. And this is really the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how of these things. As the willful king sets out this in great rage to destroy and annihilate many, um, there's going to come one who's going to come on behalf of Israel. He's going to come to their defense. You and I know him. We actually know what his name is. His name is faithful and true. Amen? Verse 11, Revelation 19, And now I saw heaven opened. And so we switch to the heavenly scene. We know what the earthly scene is. It's a war. All of the nations of the earth are gathered together. Destruction like the world has never seen. The, the same things that Jesus mentioned in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. This, this time unprecedented in human history. And we've had world wars, amen? The United States, as horrific as World War II was, we lost 465,000 men and women during the Second World War. If you were to include, include everyone who died under Stalin and Lenin, um, perhaps as much as 40 million or so people perished. But your Bible says at least a third in one single battle of the entire world's population will be wiped out, and it had to happen after today. The current population of the world is beginning to exceed some seven billion people, maybe pushing eight. You're talking just this one event that at least a couple of billion people would be wiped out. Now, you may be saying, I don't want to be around for that. Here's the good news. If you know Jesus, you won't. You'll be in heaven looking back, and here's one of the reasons we know that. And heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he makes War and judges, his eyes were like the flame of fire, his head were like many crowns, and he had a name written that no one except he himself knew. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Anybody remember how John's gospel start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was, so Jesus is the word of God, isn't he? Jesus is coming again. And the armies in heaven, here's where you come into the picture. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen. The only way I'm getting fine linen in heaven is because my Jesus made me fine. Amen? Amen. I'm clothed in his righteousness. I'm not looking for my own righteousness. I won't make my own garments white. He will have made my white garments white. 
He will have been exactly what Isaiah said, though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as wool, white and clean, and followed him on white horses. Can you imagine the scene as this unfolds? This is heaven, folks. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. Why? Because the nations have aligned themselves with the Antichrist. The nations have come against Israel. The nations have divided the land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nations have dispersed the Jewish people to the world. This is the reason. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and, check it out, wrath of Almighty God. So when the Apostle Paul says to the church, for I have not appointed you unto wrath, but unto salvation, I take that quite literally. I don't plan on being here when Jesus comes back. I'm coming back with Jesus when Jesus comes back. Amen? So there's good news for the church. Jesus is coming soon, and we'll be coming with him. Here's the bad news for the world. Better start thinking about what we're doing with Israel, and you better start thinking about whether you know the King of kings and Lord of lords, because when he comes back, he's going to be known as the Word of God and King of kings and Lord of lords. One of the reasons in this church we focus on the Word of God is because the Word of God is true, and every man is a liar. I believe what the Bible says. Now, I'm not telling you that God gave me a specific vision that the Lord's coming back next week, next month, or next year. But I am telling you, we have the end of the story. We know what's going to happen at the end. Notice what it says. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of lords. Amen? No king above him and no one mastering him is what that means. He is the supreme authority. Who is the only one that that could be? That would be God himself, God Almighty. So when Jesus, who is the word, when we refer him to him as God incarnate in human flesh, it's because he's also king of kings and lord of lords. He's the great I am. He's not lacking in power. Don't mistake his humility for a lack of ability. Amen? He has the power to overrule absolutely everything on this earth. And what he wills to do, he shall purpose. Chapter 14 tells us of the great harvest that will be the earth at that time. And I looked Verse 14 of chapter 14, the book of Revelation. And there was before me a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the, what did Daniel call Jesus? The Son of Man. With a crown of gold on his head. You see why we say, if you understand the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, all, all of a sudden comes alive to you. With a gold crown on his head. And a sharp sickle in his hand, and another angel came out of the temple and called with a loud voice to him who's sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is ripe, and he was seated on the cloud and swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Oh, this is devastating. If you read the end of this, this is the winepress of the wrath of God. And blood flowed out of it, traveling some 1,600 stadia. That, that is the distance, if you were to map that out, from the port city of Haifa to just south of Jerusalem. That all of the nations of the earth have gathered together to come against the Jewish people, to come against God's plan for national Israel. This willful king that we see rise up in this passage is going to attempt to counterfeit the Lord Jesus 
in every possible way. He will pitch his royal tents. He wants to have a one-world government. He wants to have a one-world religion. He wants to have a one-world monetary system. He wants to be worshipped. And so he sets up his royal tents in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's like, yeah, come on over here. What do we do with this? How do we apply it? If you're here tonight, and again, forgive me, I mean no offense in the sense of offending anyone's sensibilities, but to the person who believes there's no millennial reign, believes there is no rapture to the church, believes that ultimately uh, we're already in the kingdom age, there's not going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ, that all of these things are symbolic to that person, they have a really tough time in looking at this and not seeing it fulfilled literally because we know the previous 35 verses were all fulfilled literally. It makes no sense whatsoever to now change to some symbolic relationship in these final six verses. But as with all unfulfilled prophecy, we have to be careful about saying too much about what Scripture doesn't say. Is there an ongoing battle between good and evil? Of course. Have there been wars and rumors of wars throughout mankind's mankind's sojourn on this earth? Yes. But there has been nothing like what's described here. Some people worship false gods today, but not everyone on the face of the earth is going to worship one God. That still hasn't happened. You may be saying to yourself, well, that's why I don't have credit cards. I'm not going to get a chip in my forehead. That's great, by the way. But there's never been a time in human history where that was even possible until we get to today. There hasn't even been the opportunity for global leadership to come along and solve global problems because we didn't even start talking about those global things until perhaps the 40s or the 50s. And so when I look at this passage of Scripture, what it causes me to do is remember who it is that we worship and why we worship him. Because he is unwilling that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't desire for anyone to go through these things. God has never planned. God created hell itself for exactly a single occupant and his minions. And that was Satan. He doesn't want anybody to go there. But the fact of the matter is you have to choose. You have to make the decision as to where you're going to spend your eternity. And so all of this that we see that just seems so unfair, it's like, why would God do these things? This gives you a sense of how seriously God takes the issue of loyalty to him and sin in the life of human beings. He's saying, look, you can can do anything you want. You have free will. You have choice. I'm asking you to choose me. I want to have a love relationship with you. But in order for that choice to have any meaning... When Jesus said, it is enough that you believe, if there's nothing to believe in, no choice to be made, then your belief would be meaningless. And so there must be something for you to choose. That something is evil. That something is sin. That something is Satan. And if you make no choice, then you've made a choice. Because you're born in sin, conceived in it. David said, I was conceived in sin. And so God is really saying to us, I want you to read these things that are still future, and I want you to take them seriously because I'm not playing around. I'm actually going to allow these things to happen. And then the end will come. Romans chapter 11 gives us some insight. Verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. It was a mystery to the apostle Paul. 
lest you should be wise in your own opinion, like you kind of already know what's going down. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until, would you please circle that word? Here it comes. The fullness of the times of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, the age of grace comes to a close. The time when Israel, remember what Jesus said as he descended the Mount of Olives and he stood by that fig tree and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I desired to, to you who kill your prophets. You who tried to kill guys like Zechariah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, the guys that were telling I sent them to you, but you tried to kill them. I would gather you unto myself as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not come. And so Jesus cursed that fig tree. He said, I'm going to give the fruit to another group called the church. I'm going to usher in the age of Gentiles. But there's an end to that time. There's a fullness to that time until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then notice verse 26. The Apostle Paul, who used to be Pharisee Paul, who used to be a member of the Sanhedrin, who was present at the stoning of Stephen, the man who knew everything there was to know about Judaism, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written for a deliverer will come out of Zion and he'll turn away the ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. How are your sins taken away? They're not taken away by the law. They're not taken away even by the day of atonement. They're put away, but they're not taken away. They're not erased. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. It is only at the name of Jesus that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Our King is coming, church, and we need to be busy about our Father's business because our King is coming, church. We know the end of the story. I remember I was talking uh, more than 20 years ago with Pastor Chuck, and for those of you that know the history of Calvary Chapel, and we've been mocked and scorned for actually believing that this stuff is true. There are people in the evangelical Christendom circles who believe that this is nonsense, and some of those people with whom I would woefully uh, say I have disagreement, I, I don't want to, but I do, One of the great reasons that I have the hope I have is that I know that every moment that I'm alive on this earth is a moment that the age of grace has not come to a close. But there's still time for people to repent of their sin, to fall on their face and be saved. But there's a reason for every day. He's created us in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them, amen? And the chief purpose of the church That's why I I tell you frequently and often, the chief purpose of the church, as wonderful as some of the social things that we do uh, are, is not social things. It is not politics. The church is not a political arm of some political party. The church is made up of disciples of Jesus Christ. And the disciples of Jesus Christ declare that Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. So our job is not to promote a political agenda. It's not a conservatism versus liberalism thing. It's not a Republican versus Democrat thing. It is, I am a Christocrat. The one that matters is Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's coming again. He's promised to keep those whom he's committed until the day of Christ Jesus. And I cling to the, to the promise of Habakkuk. Lord, in your wrath, 
Remember mercy. Remember mercy. Don't give me what I've earned. Don't give me what I've deserved. Lord, thank you for the grace that saved me through Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord. And so the application of this is not, oh, wow, we know what's going to happen at the end. It's Jesus is coming again. And when he comes back, he's not coming to go back to the cross. He's not coming back to die again for people's sins. Once was sufficient. He, he's not coming so that you and I can, can be simply awed by his appearance from heaven. He's coming to destroy sin and death and hell and get rid of these things forever. And so it should stimulate us to preach the gospel with the, every fiber of our being, to tell people about Jesus, not to be worried, oh, I don't know, you know, where does Ezekiel 38 fit with 39 and where does Gog and Megan? That's all wonderful. And I have spent oodles of time trying to figure those things out. But I can tell you this, my king's coming and I'm coming back with him. And I want to tell people about the king before he comes back. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we come as your children. And Lord, I want to pray right now. Lord, if there's anyone in this house tonight, if there's someone here who does not know you, Lord, that as we close this service, as the pastors come forward, um, that they would get up out of their seat and they would no longer play games with you because you, you are not going to tarry forever. Lord, today is the day of salvation unto them who believe. And so, Lord, I pray that salvation would come to the house of God if anyone is here tonight that doesn't know you. God, that by the Spirit, you would convict them and convince them of the power of the gospel to save to the uttermost. That if we will believe you, Lord, who you are, that you are in fact the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, that you died on Calvary's cross for us personally, that the shedding of your blood was sufficient to cleanse all of our unrighteousness. If we will believe in you and that you were raised from the dead, that we will have eternal life, our sins can be forgiven. Now, Lord, we ask that you would move by your spirit to bring salvation tonight to someone. For those of us who are here tonight and we know you, Lord, we, we repent of our lackadaisical attitude of the gospel. Lord, we, we ask that you would stir up a fire within us that's unquenchable, that we'd forget about what it is that occupies our day, that, that wastes your time, God, your valuable time because our King is coming again. And Lord, please use us for your majesty and for your glory, for your goodness and your gospel to bring men to repentance where we can't save anyone, but we can tell them about the one who can and will if they will just simply turn from their wickedness. And so, Lord, we love you. Stir up within us a fire in your church. Cause us to do your will and your will alone. And we ask this in the precious, the wonderful, the glorious name of Jesus, our soon coming King. It's in his name we pray. Amen.